It can be said that the late 90s and early 2000s shaped modern NASCAR more than any other era. Its impact on the schedule remains today. Why are there so many intermediate tracks? How did the mile and a half become the favorite choice of track designers? And how did we get here? The 90s were a crazy time. Short tracks were dying. When a dozen major tracks were built across the country, none of them were short tracks. Some people even thought Bristol and Martinsville would die. Why were they so unpopular with the racing industry? And what were people in the 90s thinking? To look back at the stumbling block for short tracks, we see there were several reasons why they were threatened at the time. The first was field size. They just couldn't fit enough cars on the track. For example, in 1985, 40 cars started the Daytona 500. One week later, only 30 took the green at Richmond. As the sport was growing and more cars entered races, you just couldn't limit the field size to that small. To protect their future, the Richmond Fairgrounds track announced in June 1987 they would expand from a half mile to three quarters of a mile track in 1988. The track was just too small, and there weren't enough pit stalls on pit road. But Richmond wasn't the only track like that. Bristol, Martinsville, and North Wilkesboro also started less than 32 cars on a regular basis. By 1994, there was a growing feeling that short tracks might eventually be dropped completely from NASCAR, completely unthinkable today. In a February 1994 article in Winston Cup Scene, Dale Jarrett openly wondered if three-quarter mile tracks would someday be the smallest tracks they go to. He said it wasn't possible to start more than 34 cars because, quote, you'd be lapping somebody on the first lap. Over the last few years, big teams and big names like Richard Petty, Ken Schrader, and Harry Gant had all failed to qualify for short track races. How would major companies react if their big names missed the show? Several teams were sent packing early. Their weekend cut short because they were failing to make the field. They just weren't fast enough. About as degrading as I've ever felt, you know. I'd Make no mistake about it, short track racing is a contact sport. This also brings us to the issue of cars hitting each other. NASCAR grew in popularity because it was a contact sport. The sight of two cars beating and banging on a short track is what made racing exciting and also made it marketable for larger tracks. On every lap, all around the narrow ribbon of asphalt, these warriors engage in door-to-door -door combat. In August 1991, Jeff Bodine said it simply, This is a contact sport. If we didn't do it, nobody would show up. Yeah, well, the son of a bitch just slammed into me. No, he didn't slam into you. He didn't bump you. He didn't nudge you. He rubbed you. And rubbing son is racing. Well, okay, rubbing is racing, but not if the teams and sponsors had anything to say about it. Oh, there goes the fender. <laughs> The message has been passed around from the sponsors and from the, the officials here with NASCAR and from our car owners that this isn't just Saturday night racing anymore. This is big business and we've got to conduct ourselves professionally out on the racetrack and, and try to create a good image. Well, it's definitely not like it used to be. They won't let us drive the way we want to drive. We've got to go out there and take it easy and be real cautious and everything and and plus a lot of the fans didn't like the rough drive and they wanted to see everybody pass each other what they call fair and square and clean and all that but i mean i'm i like to drive harder i can drive harder i can do, do be more aggressive like i was in 88 and 89 but nascar won't go for it they want everything to be real smooth and real calculated and hey, if that's what they want and that's as long as everybody else is doing it that's 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 fine when you've got guys sitting in California or, or Washington State that never see a race and all of a sudden they turn on their TV and we're running all over each other and beating and thrashing and they think it's roller derby, man. And, you know, they think it's a put on. It's that type of sport. But when you come out here and you see guys run clean and you see them drive as hard as they can drive, then it becomes more of an art form almost. And I say, man, that guy really can do something with a car. Hard as it may be to believe, that hard-charging, rough-driving style of racing was not what sponsors in NASCAR wanted to present in the mid-90s. Even worse, as cars got more expensive to build, the damage from short tracks cost teams a lot of money to fix. It may have been wildly popular, but that was being left behind in the name of progress. Racing today. What, what, what do these gentlemen think about the direction of the sport, the future? What do you envision, let's say, five years from now? 
What are we going to see in Winston Cup racing? I think it's going to change, but I don't know how it's going to change. Well, I think uh, the inevitable is uh, if we do see some places where the, sp the sport can go, new venues, yeah. it will go there. The hot word in the mid-1990s was market. Bring auto racing to where the most people live. It was like businessmen were looking at a map and picking out the largest cities and building tracks there. Roger Penske took Los Angeles. The France family took Chicago. Bruton Smith got Dallas. There were other tracks built in Miami, Las Vegas, Kansas, Kentucky, Nashville, another one in Chicago, St. Louis, Denver, and Memphis. And because of the feeling that short tracks couldn't handle large fields, and that rough driving was unprofessional, or at least undesired, track designers made big tracks. No designer wanted to build a track that would promote the destruction of valuable cars. Out of all the new circuits, Memphis was the only one less than a mile, and having a track around a mile and a half gave the owners options. They could also run IndyCar races there, where that clearly wasn't possible on short tracks. This is somewhat ironic because IndyCar has left intermediate tracks off their schedule for some time. But in the 90s, the future of auto racing was not at short tracks. The first short track to fall was North Wilkesboro. Its death has been covered before and was due to the clever maneuvering of two track owners. In July 1994, Roger Penske announced the construction of the California Speedway. Upon its groundbreaking, NASCAR guaranteed a cup race for the track when it opened in 1997. This was the first time a track was put on the NASCAR schedule before it was built. But with the race already promised for California, NASCAR refused to expand the schedule any further when Texas Motor Speedway opened and New Hampshire wanted a second race as well. So with NASCAR's blessing, North Wilkesboro was bought and its dates were scavenged. North Wilkesboro was abandoned in September 1996. Its death was unpopular inside and outside of NASCAR. Banging fenders on a short track at Wilkesboro, yeah, we got expensive cars and it costs a lot of money to do that today, but it's kind of like a payback. And we gotta always be thinking about what we're giving back and not what we're taking all the time. And I don't want to see us get in a situation where it's take, take, take from the fans, from the sponsors, from everybody. One day we'll wake up and they won't be there. And our old friends will be gone too. So we got to maintain that fan base. We got to maintain that grassroots level of racing that we all love to make the sport continue to grow and flourish. For Winston Cup to outgrow North Wilkesboro is progress. But if the price of that progress is the death of this racetrack, then this is a sad day indeed. The rub in his race and appeal of sock car racing was slowly fading away, and everyone could feel its loss. It was around 1997 when the term cookie cutter track started to appear. When Bruton Smith and Speedway Motorsports opened their new track in Texas, it looked familiar. From above, Texas Motor Speedway was the same shape and size as Charlotte Motor Speedway. Not only that, Atlanta Motor Speedway was being reconfigured to that same general shape. Track designers across the country were in general designing similar shapes. The track in California was the same length and shape as the existing track in Michigan, but had slightly less banking. The tracks in Kansas, Chicago, Las Vegas, and Kentucky were also a mile and a half, and practically the same shape. These similarities meant track owners had to go through an education process for the fans. While the tracks may look similar to average people, they really were different due to slight changes in banking, and some tracks might be more bumpy than others. That's that flat section of this racetrack that makes Kentucky Speedway so unique compared to other mile and a half tracks. Except it was a little harder to explain that for tracks like Charlotte and Atlanta, which both had 24 degrees of banking. But by their own admission, many track owners soon realized the designers did a bad job in creating these tracks. Within a few years, millions of dollars were spent tearing up tracks and redesigning them. After the first race at Texas, drivers complained that the transition from the banking in turn four was too rough and the turns were too narrow. The tracks spent $500,000 in 1997 reworking the transitions. The second race was just as destructive, and the turns were immediately reworked again at the cost of $4 million. The banking was changed to 24 degrees, just like Charlotte and Atlanta, but at least the crashes stopped. To make it different from the other tracks, the Turn 1 banking was reduced in 2017 to only 20 degrees, and now it's one of the most treacherous on the circuit. It's sideways! Bell already sideways in front of the field! 
The Homestead Miami track was even worse. It was initially designed as a mile-and-a-half version of Indianapolis with four distinct turns. After three years, the track realized it was too hard to pass, so they spent $8.2 million to change it from a rectangle to an oval. And in 2003, they realized that the six degrees of banking also made it very hard to pass, so they spent another $10 million to increase the banking to 20 degrees. Las Vegas was too flat, so in 2006 it was torn up and more banking was added to the turns, increasing it from 12 degrees to a progressive banking that went up to 20 degrees. In 2012, Kansas also increased their banking from 15 to 20 degrees progressive banking. As these so-called cookie-cutter tracks were built and then rebuilt, the potential demise of tracks like Bristol and Martinsville continued to be a common and believable rumor. In April 1999, John Andretti was quoted as saying, We need to run on short tracks. You have to have a variety of tracks. If you're going to go out and run cookie-cutter racetracks everywhere, that's not exciting. He continued by saying, Variety gives people a reason to follow you from this racetrack to that racetrack. But fans and drivers complained that there wasn't much variety in the new tracks. Even if fans loved them, no one wanted to build a new track that would promote crashing and damage to expensive cars. So user-friendly tracks of a mile and a half were built in major markets that were also appealing to major corporate sponsors. Not only did they have too much contact, Bristol and Martinsville were also viewed as unappealing to some because of the markets they were in. The hills of eastern Tennessee and southern Virginia were not as exciting to sponsors as cities like Chicago and Dallas. If they were going to pay millions of dollars to teams and to NASCAR itself, companies wanted more exposure than they would get in rural areas. There's a reason North Wilkesboro doesn't have an NFL team, but Dallas does. The same mentality was at the heart of the schedule realignment. Beyond the issue of markets, backlash against intermediate track design was growing inside the sport. In June 1999, at Michigan, Dale Jarrett led 150 laps and won a caution-free race. Even the other drivers couldn't help but call it boring. Um, pretty boring day for me today, actually. You had a great look at that number 88 car. Where was he strongest, Jeff? I did. Uh, I couldn't see him. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I saw him when he was letting off there at the end to make it look good. <laughs> Gordon even called it the Boring 400 in other interviews. This race broke open the floodgates. The popularity of NASCAR as a contact sport was being taken over by track designers who created wide and fast tracks where close racing wasn't promoted. And even after the 1999 Boring 400, more of these cookie cutter tracks were on the way. If NASCAR wanted to go into new, bigger markets, they were stuck going to whatever track was built. Driver criticism for these new tracks came in. In the summer of 1999, Kyle Petty was quoted as saying, Racing on the track is changing. In some ways it might be better, but I don't think boring is for the better. In September 2001, Dale Earnhardt Jr. called the Chicagoland Speedway poorly designed, saying the transitions to and from the banking are terrible there. In 2003, Bobby Hamilton said they keep saying they design cookie-cutter tracks because of the seating, and so the fans can see more. That seems odd to me because the racing's so much better at tracks like Bristol and Richmond. That same year, Humpy Wheeler compared cookie-cutter tracks to the unpopular multi-purpose sports stadiums built in the 70s. Tracks should be built with one purpose in mind instead of being user-friendly for many series. Humpy was quoted as saying, Tracks have got to have character because people talk about them and the excitement they produce. It was apparent that short tracks in NASCAR's traditional circuits were being pushed out of the sport. In particular, rumors that Martinsville would lose a race were so prevalent that even Jeff Gordon had to make a public plea for it to remain. Entering the April 2004 race at the track, Gordon was quoted as saying, We need to have short tracks on our schedule, and we can't have a series that's nothing but 1.5 mile tracks. Gordon maintained that opinion even after a chunk of the Martinsville surface came up that weekend and cost him a chance at the victory. Criticism for larger tracks from fans and media members was prevalent as well. As if the track situation couldn't get any more unusual, in February 2002, a citizen of Texas filed a lawsuit against NASCAR in order to get Texas Motor Speedway a second date on the schedule. It was alleged that the France family was conspiring against Texas because they didn't own a part of the track. 
As it turned out, it was possible for one man to change the NASCAR schedule. To settle the lawsuit, NASCAR agreed to the following conditions. ISC will sell Rockingham to Speedway Motorsports and transfer its one date to Texas, in effect killing Rockingham from the schedule. Using the money from the sale, ISC would buy Martinsville Speedway, ensuring it would stay on the schedule. One of the dates at Darlington would be transferred to Phoenix. And finally, ISC would sell the Nazareth Speedway, whose attendance had been shrinking in recent years. Therefore, that track was also axed and would ultimately fall into disrepair. Within 10 years, the shape of NASCAR was changed completely. In 1996, the amount of races on tracks less than a mile was 26%. In 2005, it was down to 17%. In 1996, 19% were on intermediate tracks between 1.5 and 2 miles in length. In 2005, that figure had nearly doubled to 36%. For the most part, the schedule in 2020 is largely the same. Over the last decade, fans and industry members have voiced support for more short tracks in NASCAR. The mentality that crashes make the sport look unprofessional is gone. In fact, they're often promoted in commercials. The contact sport mentality is coming back. It's a contact sport when you're in Martinsville. <laughs> We're going to see a lot of that. Drama and excitement is what attracts people to the sport. But what do you think? Are there enough short tracks as options? Are the cookie cutters something NASCAR is stuck with? And what tracks should NASCAR go to? Make sure you leave a comment below. And as always, thank you for watching.